another tip I want to throw out there. You can oh, 10x your, your comedy game if you just oh, incorporate write, this one tip. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> and that is, I hope you know it already because you've done stand-up. Yeah. But it's... So I was thinking that um, we would just like talk a little bit about your experiences, get into like the onion, get into the books, get into the podcast. Sure. Um, maybe some yeah. tips and tricks as well. Um, I'd be delighted. Cool. And um, yeah, tell me about tell me about your audience a little bit. So I was a comedian in uh, in Germany. I worked there for like a for uh, as a journalist for Deutsche Welle, their international broadcaster and got into stand-up comedy, loved it, uh, met a lot of great people. And so um, now that I'm back in the US, because I'm currently in California, have been here since uh, October, um, and unable to do comedy, like stand-up comedy, I'm getting really into like the writing aspect of it. Right. And i um, very curious about how to like, you know, be a better writer, be a better comedy writer. And okay. so, Long answer short, um, this YouTube channel is to help um, comedy pursuers, you know, with stand up, writing jokes, uh, things like that. Okay. Um, it's meant to be somewhat entertaining as well. Yeah, I saw, I saw some of your videos. I definitely um, uh, appreciate that you're, that you're being silly with it because, you know, I do the very same thing, but I'm just dead serious about it. Yeah, that. <laughs> that's my, it's my, my brand. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like. I'm just trying to have some fun with it as well. But that's oh, smart. It's good. Yeah, People but always ask me like, why? Why isn't this stuff funny? And I'm like, look, it's serious. We're trying to be serious about doing comedy. I don't have time for <laughs> I'm joking around. Because um, I could just be hilarious. <laughs> yeah, working at the working at the Onion for so many years, I was known for always like stopping people from like having fun and joking around, I'd be always like yell at him and say, more of that on the page, more of that on the page. Because, <laughs> oh, really? you know, they put all their comedy energy into like goofing around and having fun. Yeah. I want it in the product. You know, I want yeah. it in the <laughs> thing that's going out that we're making money off of. I mean, but that makes sense from an editor, you know, like you want yeah, the business editor, standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. You want them to be like on point and like focused on exactly. the product, you know? So exactly. That's cool. So I still have that mindset. So, okay, how did you get started? I mean, I've read a lot about you and stuff like that, but, um, you know, I don't know everything, of course, but, like, how did you get started in, as, like, a founding editor of The Onion uh, and uh, into comedy as well in general? Yeah, so I, like many comedy people, knew from a very young age that I wanted to do comedy. It was just a thing that I enjoyed, and I got love and attention for trying to do it. So I gravitated toward that. I drew funny pictures for my oh. grandma and she loved those. And when I was really young, <laughs> I, I made like comedy books and I stapled them together. Oh, uh, wow. And I wrote comedy stories in high school. I did a comic strip for my high school newspaper, like always yeah. trying to just get my comedy out there constantly in every medium. Yeah. And so when I got out of high school and was faced with the prospect of, okay, now how do you get a job? How do you make a living when comedy is the only thing that you do? Yeah. So I, I had to start getting really serious about it. And I've never been much of a businessman or a business minded person. I'm very much a creative minded person. I'm always thinking of this crazy idea and that crazy idea. I'm never thinking in mm -hmm. terms of how can you profit from it? How can you uh, leverage this to make a living? <laughs> But for a brief spell there, I, I took a couple of like um, uh, self-improvement uh, audio tapes like Tony Robbins and Earl Nightingale and stuff like oh, okay. this. Jay Abraham was really valuable to me. And some of them were focused on like being an entrepreneur and building a business and this sort of stuff. And they got me thinking in terms of, okay, so yeah, there's this thing, this thing I love to do, which is comedy. But there's also this thing you have to do, which is make a living. Hmm. how do you find a Venn diagram where the being funny overlaps with the making money and there's a little sliver of things you can do in there that do both. Yeah. And the first thing I settled on in there was drawing comic strips because I knew how that worked. You wrote yeah. a comic strip, you send it to a newspaper and they would pay you money. Yeah. <laughs> and you got into more newspapers, they, you would get more money and yeah. then you could put out books, you could put out t-shirts. And so I totally understood that profit model. Yeah. And I pursued that hard for years 
I just drew comic strips and tried to get them published. And, you know, years of failure, basically, working at Burger King, working at McDonald's, um, living in my father's basement for $100 a month, oh. <laughs> and um, odd jobs. And for one summer, I didn't have uh, a job, and I literally lived on a single hot dog with no bun and a vitamin pill every day for the whole oh summer. Jeez. So that's but dedication. I drew, drew a lot of cartoons. And yeah. finally, after a few years of that, finally started to get some published. I published some in some alternative weeklies. Okay. I, um, I was very ambitious and I put together a list of all the newspapers in the country and I sent them my cartoon. I also sent it to the big syndicate because I knew that's how they were distributed. Yeah. Always, always rejected by them. So, and then uh, I finally hit it big with a comic strip in the college newspaper where I lived in Madison, Wisconsin. Mm. Uh, it's a comic strip called Jim's Journal. And oh, yeah. it was just a stick figure character that told you what he did every day. And it was very simple and it really caught on big. And so I was able to syndicate that to other college newspapers. I put out books. Uh, one of the first one made the New York Times bestseller list, oh just self-published book. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was that w well liked. And I, I did t-shirts. So I did all the things you were supposed to do to make money um, from doing comics. Yeah. And because of that comic strip, I became like this local comedy celebrity in Madison. And I knew all the other comedy people and sort of knew the lay of the land. And yeah. so when these two really smart business guys had this idea to start um, a college humor magazine, mm. they approached me and I thought it was a really exciting idea. I thought they were really amazing, mm. um, just super impressive guys. And so I, I dove in all in with them and that became The Onion. We worked on that for a year and I was essentially a, an unpaid editor, but I also did oh, okay. a lot of different comic strips for them. And after that first year, they decided they wanted out. And so they sold it to me and oh. two other people. And so then I became the editor in chief owner, co-owner for the next like 15, 20 years. Yeah, geez. And, you know, just churning out an issue of the onion every week, oh trying to learn how to um, appeal to a college audience and mm. learn how to do satire building a comedy staff and then uh we went online about eight years into it and then our readership really exploded yeah uh, because before that it was only in print and uh you probably know the story from there yeah and was like the onion always focused on new satire or did it sort of no not, not well tangentially so okay. well i should say primarily the okay. front page was always was always like a big parody news story and in the early wow. days it was more like a tabloid like um uh parody of weekly world news we did things like um emperor of saturn to enslave us all and um uh the, you know meet the amazing worm boy the boy raised by worms who took on worm characteristics and stuff like this that's awesome <laughs> just silly you know tabloid stuff and over the years, I learned that doing these more subtle, satirical uh, news parodies was a lot funnier. Yeah, like you could you could still hit that mass audience with the big kind of um, like mainstream ridiculous. humor, yeah. ridiculous humor. But you could also have layers of uh, really deep intelligence, really interesting subtext. Yeah, and then you're exposing yourself to a much wider audience. So I was all about that. You know, The Simpsons. Uh, went on the air the same year that The Onion was founded, 1989. Oh my gosh, wow. I guess I didn't, yeah. yeah. Or actually, it was 88. I'm, I misspoke. And Still around the same time. That's incredible. Yeah. And so we grew in tandem with The Simpsons. We learned from them. I like to think that they, <laughs> they learned from us, probably not. <laughs> but, hey, you never know. Uh, probably. <laughs> you never know. Maybe eventually. I mean, like right now, there's a former Onion writer writing for The Simpsons. So they did oh. eventually. There you go. But, yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that I appreciated so much about The Simpsons, and people forget this when it first came out, it was such a controversial show. It was really? all anybody was talking about how 
crude it was. Ah, and yes. How, how low brow it was. And oh my God, they're showing children disobeying their parents. Yeah. And, uh, the actually, president of the United States went on TV and said, <laughs> people should be spending their time watching the Waltons, not the Simpsons. <laughs> and, you know, Which, oh, that's awesome. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. But I actually was things about that. <laughs> I actually wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons. Yeah, no, no, it was like a, it was considered like a real risque show. But yeah. one of the things they did that that I really appreciated was they delivered the comedy in layers. So okay. they had the Homer Simpson is fat and he burps uh, yeah. jokes for the dumb people, and then they had like these obscure Silas Marner references for the really smart people. And yeah. they never compromised on that. They always appealed to every single, single layer of person on the strata. That's and I knew that was a big part of their success. They were a phenomenon when they first came out. Everybody mm. was selling Bart Simpson merchandise. And uh, it was just like, a phen it was a phenomenon. It was a, it was a huge deal with the Simpsons. So, it was definitely something worth studying and learning from. But, yeah. you know, over time at The Onion, I wanted to achieve that same mastery of producing comedy that's so broadly appealing that just about anybody you show it to is going to find something in it yeah. that they think is hilarious. And, you, and like in a lot of your content, you say that there's, um, there's a lot of like techniques and tips and tools that comedian writers can use that is not you know, it's not inventing, inventing the wheel again. It's uh, using tried and true methods, tried and, to, tried and true characters, things like that. Um, yeah, you, there's, yeah you, there's nothing new. There's, there, you know, every joke has been told, all comedy yeah. has been done. Yeah. It's just a matter of how are you packaging it and how are you updating it yeah. uh, for a modern audience. So when we started doing really well with The Onion time, it was, you know, 10 years into it. Hmm. I had gotten to be really experienced with how to create humor, how to write it, and even how to perform, put it in other media as well, because we had started doing the Onion Radio News, which hmm. I did voices for. We, we started doing on, Onion Videos in the mid-2000s, which I also performed for. And I was, I'd been doing voice work and other stuff and speaking, like was doing stand-up and speaking publicly. Okay, I was impressed well. with your voice, so yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. Oh, I wasn't even trying. So, but um, it was the, good. Uh, yeah. Sorry. The, what I realized was that I really had figured out how to do it. Like, I yeah. totally knew it. And so, in 14, I decided to write down how to do it. And I wrote okay. this book called How to Write Funny. Yeah. And it was just the, the way you, you tell a joke, basically. Yeah. And I knew from talking to so many other comedians and comedy writers that we all go through this process, but nobody had ever spelled it out before. I'd mm. written and I'd read a lot of those other books about how to be funny or how to write funny. Like Steve Allen put one out a few years ago. Mm. And his was the most serious attempt, but it was awful, awful book. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's just, it's just like him ranting and then his sec transcribed it. So it's disjointed, oh. you know, unrelated tidbits of advice about the business. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the business in 1960s era comedy business, like totally useless now, but <laughs> well, a lot of the other books. Happened. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the other books were trying to be funny. Like they're trying to put jokes in there and mm. and they were telling stupid stuff like comedy comes in threes. You gotta go yada da, yada da, yada da. You know, and just <laughs> stupid, like hacky stuff. Yeah. And, that's... and I I knew that people weren't, you know, the really good people weren't doing that stuff. The real yeah. good people had a totally different process. So yeah, I wanted to just write it all down, get it, um, spell it out, and I just put out that book on Amazon myself. I just self-published it and uploaded oh, okay. it. Yeah, and I've seen it both everywhere. So it started to sell and um, it sort of took off. And so that book was about how to write a joke. So I wrote a sequel about how to write a longer piece of comedy or like a bit or mm. a sketch. And um, that's called How to Write Funnier. And I'm working on how to write funniest. It's about how to work within a team to produce really funny comedy. Ah, nice. But um, yeah, so that's it's kind of dovetailed into, um, in tandem, I had started teaching comedy at the Second City as yes. part of a deal that The Onion had with Second City. Yeah. 
and we used a lot of what was in that book as the curriculum for those classes. So and now you're I've still left doing Second it? City. No, I've left Second City and I've left okay. The Onion, but like yeah. all these How to Write Funny books have led to this How to Write Funny website and courses I'm doing online and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's become this, this thing that's taking up a lot of my time. And it, yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the time, it was just like, I'm just going to explain people how to do that. I'm just going to tell people how to do this. Yeah. Well, I know you have like a Facebook group and like you've ran a recently a competition on like, you know, getting personal feedback from you on like uh, on writing comedy and stuff. And so I know you've been yes. like very active and that's actually what got me interested in learning more about you is because like uh, I can see that you've been a lot more active on the internet with like promoting your material. Um, but like back to like the tips and tricks and stuff, like what are like, what are some of those like, um, like uh, archetype characters and like, um, um, I know that one of your books, it says like the secret ingredient to like writing, you know, a good joke or a good, like, um, I guess the pinnacle, what you say is like the pinnacle of, uh, of, of comedy writing, like a, a sketch. So like, you know, take us through some of that. Yeah, like, yeah I'll throw out some tips. There, there are so many cool. in the books, but a couple of really critical ones are, so the secret ingredient that you're talking about hmm. And the best kind of comedy writing there is, is satire. So we okay. were just talking about The Simpsons. We were talking about The Onion. Um, you can look at somebody like George Carlin. Those mm -hmm. are satirical. Those are, so those are really funny. And a lot of people who don't know anything about literary, you know, humor terms or anything, we just mm -hmm. look at those things and think, oh, those things are just really funny. They're really high quality yeah. humor. <laughs> but they're, they're satirical. And that's different than regular humor, what I call formulaic humor. Nothing okay. wrong with formulaic humor. Family guy, formulaic humor. Uh, it's just like jokes uh, where characters do funny things, but there's no real statement yeah. underneath it all. Yeah. So satire just has that subtext, and that's the secret ingredient that makes uh. humor really amazing. When you have something really interesting to say about society, what's yeah. wrong with it? What's wrong with people? What is a human foible that you wish we didn't have. If you can mm -hmm. communicate that in a way that really connects with people, makes them wake up and realize, oh my God, I have that flaw. I'm, I'm a flawed person and human, human beings really should be better. Yeah. Um, if you can deliver that inside of a really funny joke, mm. the person's not gonna react like that. They're not gonna be like, oh, that's a very interesting point. They're gonna <laughs> laugh. They're gonna yeah. be cracking up because they just think, oh my God, this is incredibly funny. Yeah. But really you've sub with subterfuge you've just del delivered this really smart idea into their brain mm. without them even knowing it so it's a really powerful secret ingredient that makes humor amazing cool and you know there's also different ways to uh, come up with it and put it in your writing and and disguise it in a joke and all that stuff mm. um that I, I explain in great detail but the another tip i want to throw out there i, I always throw this out to anybody like starting out in comedy, somebody who like thinks doing comedy looks really fun and they want to get into it. Yeah. First tip I can literally 10 X your quality. <laughs> it can 10 oh. X your, your comedy game. If you oh, just incorporate write, this one tip, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> and that is, I hope you know it already because you've done stand up, <laughs> yeah. but it's Shit. avoid cliches. Ah, yes. I do know it, but I definitely have used cliches, you know, yeah, um, part of the learning process. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> easy to use. They're readily available. They're free and they work. Like that's the real danger. They work. Yeah, Audiences yeah. still like them. But as soon as you use a cliche, which is any kind of joke or joke topic or uh, comedic concept that has been done to death or has been done already, people can tell you're not an original. They can tell that you're... Yeah phoning it in and they lose respect for you. They may not say it because they're going to be laughing. If you, if you go up there and say something like, um, uh, you know, uh, what's a, what's a current cliche that that's going around right now? Well, like, I, I'm not sure of like current right now, but like, um, in Germany, I interviewed Max Gestettenbrauer, who's a, like a, <laughs> do you know, do you know? Him? No, I don't know oh, that just, name. It's such a funny name. <laughs> yeah. It's a great name. But they, um, he, he's a very good comedian. He tours all over Germany, does German content. But I talked with him and he was basically telling me that every German comedian will say something about Hitler, but it's something to get out of the way because you know, it, it marks you as like an amateur. 
Uh, it's Interesting. A, it's a very, yeah, it's a tried and true <clears throat> yeah. cliche. So uh, one cliche that would probably still work on stage now, it wouldn't be a punchline, but it would be part of the setup of, for a joke. You would say, asking for a friend. Ah, okay. Like that's a cliche that's going around that people are, some people are still going to laugh at that. But as soon yeah. as you do that, people know that you're stealing ah. jokes from other people. Yeah. And that you're not, um, you're not a quality comedian. Mm. You know, you look at any top quality comedian like George Carlin, Steve Martin, Jerry Seinfeld, mm. um, or, you know, from today, like Annie Jeselnik or Julio Torres or Bo Burnham or anybody like that. Yeah. Um, Jen Kirkman, um, <laughs> Lizzie Cooperman, they're not going to be using cliches. They're okay. writing Patton Oswalt. Yeah. never going to use a cliche they're going to use their own wording for yeah. how, how they say things and everything they say is going to sparkle with originality mm. and that's what part of a huge part of what makes them great yeah and I completely um, agree they just resist doing that because they understand that by using cliches they immediately brand themselves as someone who's not an original thinker mm. uh, who doesn't deserve to be elevated to the status of one of the greats yeah so avoid cliches yeah you know i mean honestly uh like i tweet jokes here and there and um like i usually try to stay with like you know something that i find original but then i've noticed that i really don't get any engagements with that so i have also gotten into like i dip my toe my toe into like some cliche jokes um mm -hmm. you know like you mentioned and those actually do get further engagements yeah and I mean, how do you uh, how do you work against that? I guess what do you, like what do you suggest for that? <laughs> well, I, my suggestion is, um, if you can't write original jokes that don't get as much engagement as cliches, then you just need to work on your writing more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we, we need to get better. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's an ongoing list. You mentioned one of those Facebook writing groups I'm in. Yeah, um, there's an ongoing thread where people suggest new cliches that are out there that you should ah, avoid. Okay. And the list is up to about 300 now. Oh my God. And I put them in a book, uh, just a list of all the cliches. And anybody can get that. Just go to howtowritefunny.com slash list. Okay. And you can download it for free. I and it's continuously that. updated. Yeah. So if you haven't downloaded it in a while, it's worth going back. <laughs> <laughs> um, because every cliche that you want to avoid and they come in there pretty quick because the people on that group are all um people pursuing comedy or active professional yeah. comedy writers so oh, okay. as soon as they perceive a cliche is starting to happen they put it on that list oh geez that's that's invaluable that's it's awesome. very powerful yeah it's really useful so also like um you've talked a lot about like characters and oh how, yeah you asked about the characters yeah, like so that's another book i'm working on how to write funny characters because yeah. i was noticing that they're there's just not an adequate book out there that yeah. lists all the comedic characters, how to write them, why they work. Um, because there are, in my estimation, about 30 character archetypes okay. that, that recur in comedy all the time. Yeah. There are ways to use them so that they come off as being very original. Mm. Obviously, there's ways to do them so they come off unoriginal by just yeah. copying the way someone else did it. Yeah. But there, it's a very simple process and a very simple formula for uh, using a character that you know is going to work with audience because audiences because it's worked in the past so mm. many times. But you're also going to do it in a really fresh, unique way that mm. people haven't seen before. Uh, that's critical. So that that book is in the works. Okay, cool. I mean, how did like how did these characters come to be? You know, like why do these characters work all the time? I mean, yeah, I think it, part of it is you know the Commedia dell'arte in the Renaissance had a stock company of like uh, ha less than a dozen of these characters that yeah. people uh, like the um, the bumbling authority, the mm. Lothario, um, the um, like the princess or the ingenue or whatever, mm. uh, the the naif. So there are certain characters that have always worked with audiences because there's something about them that just w resonates with us. Okay. Over the decades and over the centuries, other characters have come and gone. 
and especially like in American culture, just in the past hundred years or so, hmm. you've seen certain characters recur a lot. And a lot of them date back to the Commedia dell'arte. They're very similar to some of those characters. And um, a couple of examples. So one of them is the man child, which is a grown up right. who acts like a child. <laughs> this is a character that people love. They never get tired of it. It's super funny. Will Ferrell plays this character all the time. <laughs> exactly so what I was thinking of. <laughs> the movie uh, Step Brothers is like right. a personification of that movie. They're literally playing like 11 year old boys, you know? And it's that. funny. It's just yeah. inherently funny. It's yeah. spectacularly funny. So um, the other one that you see a lot is the bumbling authority, which I mentioned before. Hmm. So go back. Uh, Daffy Duck was a bumbling authority. Um, hmm. uh, Ralph Cramden was a bumbling, bumbling authority. Hmm. Frank Drebin from the police squad movies hmm. uh, or the spy hard movies, I guess they call them. Um, Ace Ventura, pet detective, Ron uh, Burgundy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Ted Knight, The Onion. So yeah. a bumbling authority is anyone, um, uh, Paul Bart, Mall Cop, perfect uh, yes. example. Yeah. Anybody who is like a low level authority figure, but who's a bumbling idiot. Um, yeah. People love that. They never get tired of that. And so, do you, yeah. And so do you, do you like add these characters into your writing to like make it like known that they are, so if, I mean, obviously, um, you know, you know, Trump obviously isn't a lower level uh, authority, but like, um, do you try to attribute like certain characters or characters of these archetypes into like, you know, real people for, for like the onion and stuff like that for satire? So I'm going to use a terrible and inappropriate analogy to explain how I use those because um, it's the first thing that popped into my head and it's just perfect. <laughs> so I'm just not going to let it go. Um, that would be like using the same uh, sex toy every time you had sex. Oh, okay. Like um, I want to mix it up and I want to have like, I want to do something different every time, even with a character like Trump. Like I wrote this whole book about Donald Trump. Yeah. Some, in some of the stories, he's a man child. In other stories, he's a bumbling authority. Okay. In other stories, he's uh, like um, the, um, the trickster. So yeah. there's all sorts of characters and, if you're creating a character for like a sitcom or a movie, you want to be consistent and have one archetype that you use. Mm. But in comedy, when you're like coming back to somebody over and over, you know, the onion does this thing where they'll create a character for somebody like with Joe Biden, they made him like this rust belt dirt bag. And that was just the character that they, they stuck to. And we always used to do that with political figures. We kind of pick who they were uh. and then we were, we'd go with it. Um, and that can be fun, yeah. but I, I prefer to mix it up just because the audience gets bored if you always do it the same way. And also you have to look at how everybody else is doing. You don't want to do a cliche. So mm. for example, the way that people always made fun of George W. Bush was that he was a dummy. Yeah. And that's, that's a character archetype, the character of the dummy. Yeah. Um, Homer Simpson is a dummy. Yeah. Um, uh, Woody from Cheers was a dummy. Mm. Um, there's a dummy on a, like uh, Joey from Friends was a dummy. Yeah. Um, so everybody who made fun of Bush made him the dummy. Mm. So at the onion, we always wanted to mix that up and like, well, let's do ah, something okay. different with him. So cool. we used uh, character irony for him. And we did a lot of stuff where he was like incredibly smart, um, <laughs> which is just funny because it's the opposite of what you expect. <laughs> so um, I mean, and then I did it. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that makes me laugh just hearing that, you know, so yeah, no, it's a lot, <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, th these are all, these comedy tools are all just toys, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you, as a kid, maybe that's a, a more appropriate analogy if I think of a kid with a, a room full of toys, like you wouldn't always play with the same toy every day. Yeah, you yeah. mix it up and you have fun and it makes for a lot of variety for the audience. Cool, cool. And so, okay, I know you've written about, or you've talked about this before with The Guardian about um, satire sort of, uh, being confused with like fake news over the years. Yes. Um, how like that was, I think the Guardian article that I'm referring to was like in 2016 or so. It was like right when Trump was coming, was getting elected or right after he got elected, something like that. Um, I mean, what do you have to say about that? Do you think this, it's like the pinnacle of like satire is if you can like sort of fool the, you know, fool the audience into believing it or is it just, or is that the opposite? Or does that have, is that a, 
have something to say about the readers who get duped. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um, it's all very, all that stuff is very interesting. I think they reviewed my book, if I'm remembering that article right, the Trump book mm. that we mm. were just talking about. But I think that satire works best when it's really funny and you have some really astute commentary to communicate that people are not really aware of. Mm. And I think that can be, you know, great satire has been written consistently for as far back as the ancient Greeks, you know, they were doing great. Yeah. Um, you know, Ovid was writing great satirical poetry. So there's nothing different now um, as opposed to then. The only difference now is that because the onion primarily does satire and so many like people have been inspired by the onion to do news parody satire like uh, the daily show and the Colbert show mm. a, a whole generation of Americans grew up thinking that satire is fake news but it's uh. not like satire can be anything mm. Mark Twain wrote satirical novels there are satirical yeah. movies you know they're not all news parody. <laughs> yeah. That's just an accident of history that we associate it with, uh, that we associate satire with parody news. Mm. So when people mistake a fake news story for real or, and they believe it, that's fun and it's funny and it just adds a layer of humor to uh, the satire. But um, I think that same sort of thing hap has happened in the past. Like when Jonathan Swift wrote his famous essay um, uh, about the starving children. Yeah, feeding them to Ireland. The... Yeah. Su suggesting eating them. Yeah. Um, there were people in that day and age who thought that was a real opinion and they were mortified by it. Like, oh my God, you can't be suggesting that we eat the children. <laughs> um, the modest, a modest proposal it was called. Yeah. Um, that's always been there and it's fun to make fun of stupid people who should know better, uh, who, who believe something that's obviously made up and funny, but that's yeah. never the goal. The goal is to just produce something really funny okay. and it's totally the audience's fault if they don't get it. And okay. yeah. 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 And that's just fun to, uh, expose people like that, but that's how it should work. <laughs> they okay. should be exposed and they should be laughed at. And then they, they should say, ah, you got me. Yeah, but, and hopefully but they should learn after the fact. Hopefully they learn, you know, <laughs> that they shouldn't believe everything they read because that's yeah. the ultimate message of that is that yeah. you can't believe everything you read. It's just, it's, uh, I think there's even a Reddit, subreddit, uh, there's a subreddit that says like, fell for the onion or something like that. Yeah, you not know, the like, onion, I think. Yeah, 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 not the onion where people, you know, have shown that they've like been duped and stuff. So it's pretty... Exactly. Uh, it's pretty sad, I guess. And I, but I feel like I've probably have fallen for some satire before, you know, as well too. So it just, if you, if it's, if too many people are falling for the satire and then not getting later that they were duped, then yeah. the satire is not good. Like that just ah, means it's, okay. it's too subtle and it's, it's not silly enough. And that's, okay. that's a very weird goal to like want to trick people and then keep them tricked. Like, why would you want to do that? I don't get that. So that's, that actually brings up an interesting point because uh, I'm currently taking, or I just finished taking a uh, Second City satire writing course. Oh, great. One of, the, one of the things that they always talk about is heightening the joke mm -hmm. and like, like making it more ridiculous. Yeah. And before taking this class, I actually thought, well, I actually thought the opposite. I thought you kind of wanted people to be um, grounded in the idea and to believe somewhat in the idea of what you're proposing. but yeah I mean, like, so, for, for some type of humor that's important to start okay. with to have it have a grounding in truth but yeah um the term i use is escalate so as soon as you okay. introduce your joke you want to escalate it which it means build it build on it and build on it make it funnier and funnier until it comes mm. to like a punch at, or a button at the end yeah. that's what i describe in my second book it's how any satirical piece is written it's how any stand-up bit is written or mm. any sketch um you have to escalated okay cool yeah um so also yeah your podcast how to write funny you've talked with like some pretty cool people um, yeah 
uh, Steve Kaplan, Caitlin Kunkel, and then like Weird Al. I haven't listened to the Weird Al <laughs> one yet, though. But like, yeah. very, <laughs> what, yeah, what's your takeaway with all that? Like, who did you enjoy talking with the most? And uh, what did you learn from them? Yeah, so like from anyone. I think, yeah, I think someday I'm going to put together like a book that has like takeaway advice that like so many of them agreed on okay. as far as like um, achieving success in comedy. Because I pride myself on not just talking to comedy writers and performers and actors, but also agents and managers, insiders, um, to people at various levels of success in the business because okay. there's so much to be learned from a lot of different people. Yeah. But um, yeah. So, you know, if I had to encapsulate like one thing that I've learned uh, from all of them, it's this whole idea that you have to love it. You have mm. to love comedy in order to do it. So many people I think pursue it because they seem, they think it would be fun. Mm, yeah. Like, oh, I'd, I'd like to try that. It'd be fun. Yeah. And if those people have incredible discipline, I guess they can succeed, but it's the people who truly love doing it and are doing it because they love it, mm. who are the ones who succeed. Because when you love doing something, you do it obsessively, you do it all the time, and yeah. ultimately you, you get good at it. Mm. And uh, opportunity just falls in your lap when you're good at, at comedy. Um, you, you end up pursuing it, you end up going to, improv classes you end up performing you end up getting noticed like you know uh the head writer of the onion todd hansen is a guy who loves comedy he's an inherently funny person and i encountered him first in madison wisconsin he was working at a grocery store and yeah. you would go into that grocery store and he would just be like making jokes to the customers in line <laughs> and he would be like subversively making fun of them but in a way that they didn't realize like they thought he was just chatting them up and he was so clever and so funny and he was such a, an interesting person. He had such a magnetic personality and he had a beautiful voice. Yeah. And I, you know, I recruited him uh, as soon as I was able to work for The Onion. And That's once awesome. he was on staff at The Onion and once we moved to New York, we're all like hanging out at the comedy clubs and we're meeting other people in the New York comedy scene or whatever. Yeah. And like, people noticed him like he got work doing voices for cartoons on adult swim and stuff. Oh, wow. He never had an agent. He never made a voice demo tape. It's just people heard him speak and they're like, uh, dude, you should be doing cartoons. <laughs> so like that, the people who love it and who do it obsessively, yeah. um, they get noticed, you know? And so my, my work is all about helping people who don't have that benefit because if you have okay. that benefit, you're going to be fine. Um, I feel like I never had that benefit. Like I've always struggled with it and I always had to work really hard. Nobody ever thought I was inherently funny mm. or, or talented or brilliant or anything. If anything in school, people thought I was a total loser. Um, <laughs> it was unfunny. So but I always help you, you know, <laughs> I mean, maybe, but I always go through it thinking, well, Hey, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so my, my advice is all about like, okay, let's say you're not a genius. Yeah. Then how do, you, how do you pursue this? <laughs> you know, let's say you're terrible. Well, yeah. where would you start? <laughs> so actually, that, I was going to talk about that next. Um, I mean, a lot of people who, like I've met a lot of people um, who are in like comedy who I wouldn't say are inherently funny, but yeah. um, they still pursue comedy. And I actually, I feel, I feel sort of jealous um, of, of them because they're doing something that, they probably perceive as being like quite a challenge, but also like quite a reward. Um, for me, like I've always felt like I've been the funny guy, you know, like I've always had a lot of friends by making jokes and, sh and stuff like that. But like, um, it's like, it says something more to the person who can actually like sit down and write, who like isn't considered like, you know, the funny man, the funny girl, and who can sit down, like construct or deconstruct and figure out what works, you yeah. know? And yeah, this is why I, I've always found Batman to be a more interesting superhero than Superman. Ah, okay, yeah. Superman's like a god and he can do anything. Yeah, that's a great um, analogy, yeah. It's not that interesting, but Batman had to work for it. Yeah, like, exactly. Yes, he had the fortune, but he had to like train and he had to build all that stuff. Yeah. You know, that's the real interesting thing to me. So yeah, I'm totally with you there. Um, yeah. 
And I've tried to like crack that code. And that's another thing I, I yeah. talk to people about on my podcast is how did they get into it? How did they crack the code? You know, when yeah. did they realize that they wanted to do this? Some of them, um, well, I should say none of them were born funny. Like mm, yeah, all of them came out like the rest of us, like blank slate. Yeah. So it's always some circumstance of your family dynamic or your experience with your peers that makes you decide to pursue comedy, mm. you know, for whatever reason. And I've never been a believer in the idea of like a natural genius, even somebody like Todd Hansen at the onion, mm. you know, he, there was a guy who was born into a family dynamic where because of the relationship he had with his parents and his siblings, he decided that, you know, subconsciously that he needed to become the funny guy in order to get the attention and, and love that he needed in the family. Yeah. yeah. And so it becomes like this evolutionary struggle where he's going to try to be as funny as possible hmm. for years. You know, he'll, so when he gets out of high school at 18, he's been doing it for 18 years. <laughs> That's longer than the Beatles performed music in Europe before they did an album. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to be great. You're going to yeah. be really good at that point. And I always look at people like Chris Farley or Eddie Murphy, people yeah. who, um, who succeeded very young and were just like rocket ships that you saw mm. them and you're like, oh my God, such a talent. Yeah. Um, same thing. It's always, well, they learned how to be funny at home before yeah. they ever got out there. And, uh, but do you think that it says something to be able to like, because I feel like, naturally there's a lot of there's a lot of natural funny people but then when you put when you try to like write funny on um you know for an article because you you deal primarily with like a like writing funny right yeah and like uh it's different from so if i were to go on stage and like tell some really bad jokes i can probably get some laughs just because i have an enigmatic personality right mm -hmm. but a lot of but like the next guy who's not inherently funny uh like he's probably tried his craft a lot more and he's got <clears throat> better jokes so like what do you say to like the funny guy who wants to like write funny but just like i don't know hasn't learned all the tips and tricks or something obviously yeah, study, I, I think about that a lot. And one of the reasons why I focus in my books and a lot of my courses and stuff on the writing of the comedy is because that's a more pure exercise in trying to be funny. Mm. If, if, if you grew up uh, as the funny kid or whatever, and you go on stage, it's almost like you're cheating because yeah. you're naturally funny. You could go up yeah. there and say anything and you're probably going to get laughs. Like Louis Anderson went on stage. He, he was on my podcast. Oh, awesome. uh, first, first time he went on stage, he killed because he's a funny guy. Yeah. Uh, he has like 13 siblings or some ungodly number of siblings. <laughs> and you had to be funny to get any kind of attention in that house. Yeah. And they were poor. Like, so he came from difficult circumstances. Being funny was like a survival strategy for him. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that doesn't help anybody who's trying to be funny to tell him, oh, you just have to be inherently a genius at being funny. Then yeah. you'll be fine doesn't help so when i focus on writing i know i'm stripping away all the cheats that's like, cool yeah you write it on a piece of paper and you put it out there you're not there to make a funny face you're not there to like sell it you, yeah that stuff has to work on its own merit so i'll, I'll tell you a, a really great apocryphal story that il illustrates this so lauren michaels is a smart guy who knows comedy hmm. and he held auditions for snl once at the comedy cellar in new york and he invited some comedians among them were Rob Schneider, um, uh, David Spade, and Tom Kinney. Damn. So Tom Kinney uh, was on Mr. Show. He does the voice of SpongeBob. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, he's an inherently funny guy. He mm. can go on stage and just be goofy, and people are going to go nuts. Yeah. So um, he goes up on stage at this audition, and he kills. He's running around to the audience. He's doing funny voices and funny faces, and, and doing a lot of slapstick and he kills, he yeah. kills. Rob, Rob Schneider comes up and he's awkward. He's, he's uh, scared and he tells his jokes and he bombs. Oh. Um, David Spade gets on stage and he's also a pretty new standup. He okay. does his jokes. Uh, he's very uh, flat and you know, David Spade, he's yeah, pretty yeah. flat and he bombs. Super flat. Yeah. 
Lauren Michaels hired David Spade and Rob Schneider. He did not hire Tom Kinney oh. because he could see through the performance and the inherently funniness. And he could see, oh, Rob Schneider's writing jokes. He's actually composing jokes. And David Spade is actually composing really intelligent jokes. Mm. And, you know, David Spade goes on to become the most financially successful SNL alum of all time. Oh, okay. I didn't know that he was like, wow. Yeah, he's, he's done amazing. He's had uh, two uh, successful TV series. He's done movies. He's done books. He's like, David he's Spade is. Yeah. Yeah, David Spade is an unstoppable force in comedy. I would love to have him on my podcast, but he won't return my call. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. I mean, yeah, just uh, I guess like that's the process that I'm going through right now. Like, you know, I can go on stage and like, you know, I'm, I'm like somewhat awkward, but I can like tell a joke and get some laughs because I'm like, you know, have the inherent, you know, funny, I won't say gene, but you know what I mean. But, yeah. um, but it, like there's some, like, the first time I noticed this, I watched a kid who was super awkward. Uh, like, you just kind of didn't like him when he was on stage. Like, there was just nothing about him that you liked. But his jokes were incredible. And, like, they got no laughs. And, but I was laughing. Like, uh, the other comedians were laughing. Like, we love this guy. Right. We're, right. We were just so impressed with his entire, like, uh, structure and everything. I think the same thing happened with Steve Martin and Woody Allen when they started out doing stand up ah, okay. because they were nervous and they bombed and it took them a, a long time to build up the confidence so that they could tell their jokes in a way that didn't um, make the audience uncomfortable. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, a joke, a good joke told without confidence is not going to work, but yeah. a bad joke told with confidence will work. I mean, I guess that's the, you know, that's what, there's all sorts of mediums of getting your jokes out there, you know, and yeah. like, I guess stand up is, that's why it's considered one of the, I don't, I don't know if you would call it like the pinnacle of, you know, um, of joke telling, but it's one of the obviously most, dif more difficult ways to get your jokes out there. Yeah, it's absolutely the most difficult. Um, it's uh, like sort of the holy grail of yeah. comedy because... Mm -hmm. The other stuff, like I think if you can get really good at writing jokes, um, that's one thing. Yeah. And if you can get really good at performing, that's one thing. But good stand-up is when you can compare the two hmm. and do both. You're going to do great. You're yeah. Do great. So uh, I guess wrapping this up, what do you do? You have any like uh, tips uh, for you know the viewers of this um, on writing like uh, jokes, writing stand-up stuff like that? Um, obviously buy your books, you know, listen to your podcasts and things like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what other tips? Yeah, you check out my stuff. There's a lot of free stuff. <laughs> you got books on the website and stuff and you can buy the books. And if you want to go deeper with me, I have the courses um, cool. and shops for sale. But as far as like tips go, like uh, my, my uh, number one tip is to write every day. Like yeah. write jokes every day and just make it a habit hmm. because when you write jokes every day, it's like putting money in a bank. It's like saving a penny every day. You know, hmm. one day you're going to be a millionaire, yeah. you know, and there are just so many side benefits that you get from writing jokes every day. You're never going to run out of material. You're always going to have a back list of like stuff to work with. Hmm. Um, yeah. And you don't even have to work that hard at it. Just like stream of consciousness, like, write 10 jokes and most of them will suck, but you'll, you'll get a good one every day or two. And that, that adds up, you know, yeah, that totally yeah. adds up. And, you know, then you have material to submit, you have material to try on stage. Um, and that's like st step one. And then step two would be like, get it out there, put okay, your stuff yeah. out there, get it yeah. on Twitter, go on stage and try to perform it. Um, put it in a video, hmm. you know? Um, yeah. yeah. All right, man, Scott, take care, stay safe, and, uh, you know, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to, like, everything that you're, like, putting out there and stuff. It's, Thanks, and I'm, brother. I'm going to link everything, um, you know, so that my 30 uh, viewers can actually, like. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, dude. All right, thanks a lot. Take care.